All right, let's go ahead and start introducing our guests here. Please welcome Patricia Somerset. You can sit anywhere you want that has a working mic, I hope. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Introducing next, Sean Chiplock. And he has plushies. The plushies are here. They're called family members. I'm so sorry. And please now welcome next, Joe Hernandez. And next, please welcome Jamie Mortalado. <laughs> it's the Hispanic in me that does that part. <laughs> it's just so far away from me. Like, is it, is it me? <laughs> oh, you want to come closer? Oh, I get to be feel special. At least someone's making me feel special today. Ashley. Just sharing the mic now. <laughs> well, usually yeah, the ones with in. the water bottles are the ones you guys usually get. So I'm not sure if it has a water bottle down there. We'll go ahead and pass these over there. Thank you. you guys want Patricia, water? you need water? There you go. Yes, you please. She stole mine during I the did. last panel. Hey, we did, so. yes, I did. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome. How are you guys enjoying Stack Anime this weekend? Oh, it's been fabulous. Oh, Woo! Oh, awesome town, man. Love you Testing, guys. Yeah, yeah, no, it's working. Okay. He's got a rough voice today. <laughs> I feel that too. I woke up and I like my voice was like one octave lower, and I'm like, oh my god, I sound like Johnny Cash. In my head, I do. In my head, I do. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into this. You know, uh, as we were talking a little bit with the audience earlier, you know, Breath of the Wild, amazing game. Um, Legend of Zelda has evolved over the years, and it seems every time they come out with a new game, it just, it's mind blowing. Especially when it can make fans just go disappear for weeks on end playing the game. So one of the first questions. Uh, that I like to ask of voice actors is, uh, when recording in the booth, like what are some of the challenges uh, as a voice actor that you have? Um, and I understand that you also book uh, some of the voices. And for you, uh, what are some of the challenges that you set for them? Well, the first question I would, I would pass to the, to the guys, because I'm the casting director and director of the game. And then I'm also the voice of Prince Sidon. But um, the guys will give you much better answers of uh, the experience of being in the booth, day in and day out. I'll tell you about directing and my Please experience as Prince Sidon. Um, <laughs> but uh, Joe. You know, um, specific to Breath of the Wild, one of the things that kind of caught me by surprise is like ordinarily when you record a video game, like, um, you know, just kind of traditional style is like, okay, you're just doing the video game, like just kind of making up whatever the inflections and the tones are. I didn't realize we were gonna be dubbing, like effectively like matching the flip flaps. So that kind of caught me by surprise, because had I known that, I probably would have brushed up on my dubbing a little bit more. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that was just, it was, if you guys are familiar with like dubbing and anime and all that, it's very like technical from a voice acting perspective where it's like, okay, you got to get the timing and the cadence and the delivery and all that stuff uh, right. So for me, that was a, a little bit of a challenge. Uh, just to follow up on that, you know, when, the game was originally recorded in Japanese yeah. and... Uh, so the lip sync uh, was motion captured. It was absolutely perfectly captured. A lot of times anime, there's maybe four or five mouth movements. So anime is never perfect, but the, you know, the stories are so good, you're, just, you're, you're used to it. But with this, you could not, um, the, the big challenge for the actors and myself working with them was that the lip movement was absolutely picture perfect. So finding the right words and finding the right uh, motion in the vowel to yeah. draw out a vowel, but yet put the um, performance in that moment was quite a challenge. I would and say everybody was it was a little easier in my case just because Rivali is I a know. bird. <laughs> so all these other human like characters have vowel yeah. movements and Rivali's beak is either open or closed. <laughs> yeah. And so it was it, it wasn't as much a challenge in that regard, but um, touching base on you know challenges as an actor uh, a big reason why uh, voice acting has to be treated as acting is because there is that element of, you know, suspension of disbelief, the believability. Um, as actors, if we cannot convince ourselves that we are this character, that this situation is happening, that this environment is real, 
there's no hope of being able to convince the audience that it is real. So every actor has their own way of getting themselves into that mindset of, of, of convincing themselves and becoming the character, becoming a part of this universe. Uh, for me, for instance, uh, I'm, I'm a very physical actor. You know, Even though I'm standing in this confined booth and I have to make sure I stay in front of the microphone, I love to move my hands a lot and make gesticulations. You know, I'll take poses in order to put myself into that mindset. Um, I distinctly remember when we were recording uh, lines as Rivali for Vomito when he's instructing Link, I had deliberately like placed my arms behind my back as if they were crossed over each other like wings, like he was standing like a, like a drill instructor giving instructions to Link. And it got so in depth for me that at one point I was feeling the weight of if I had wings with feathers, you know, pulling down on my arms. And it, it sounds silly, but that is, that is when you find that moment, for me, that gets you into that character and makes those reads just, just fly. Very, no pun intended. Yeah. Oh, damn. But very, very much so. That, that is a good point. I had a, a workshop yesterday, and I was talking to the, the people that are um, up-and-coming voiceover actors, that uh, your positioning, you know, some people kind of put their hands in their pocket, and all of a sudden there's a, there's a different sort of... Um, Emote that you're that you're giving if your if your posture has changed. So a lot of actors come in there, they kick off their shoes, and they're standing in front, and there's a lot of motion going on, and they come out of there. Some of them are sweating from yep. head to toe because they're really working working very hard. Um, and even some of the other games I've worked on, where maybe there's a um, little more violent games that uh, require guns. Um, we'll even have um, some toy guns in the booth, yeah. so the actor will hold hold a gun or hold a rifle, and it just it just gives you a different attitude. Mm. Yeah, I was actually thinking about um, in, in acting work, there's a lot of, uh, you know, psychological gesturing in a way. That's like one form of training that you can do for this type of work and um, use that in theater, TV, film, and also in voice acting, as, as we were just talking about. I was thinking for Zelda, um, one of the things I guess I did was um, you, you take on the, the sort of the stature and the, and the body language of the character that you're doing. And I definitely did that with her in the booth. And I would, I often, when I'm doing a character, I'll place my center of energy in a slightly different place by visualizing it up and down. Like if it's a younger character, I might have like a ball of energy that's a little bit higher and sort of bring, lifts me up. And if you're, if you're playing like a grounded, like low voice warrior, you're gonna push it down, further down into your gut and like have a stronger stance, things like that. Like, and you can work with elements, um, Anything like that, that that opens up your body in a certain way to take on more of the character that you need or the characteristic that you need and ultimately gives you a, a certain, a different kind of human behavior, really. And it, it is so unusual. Usually um, I'm always uh, professing that it doesn't matter how tall you are, how short you are, how, whatever size you are, um, that you could play any character because it, that's a great thing about voice acting. You could be at any age. I have some uh, friends that are in their 70s and still... Um, voice as a, a six-year-old and seven-year-old children yeah. and, it, and it's pretty amazing but unusual enough this game everybody sort of has some sort of demeanor Joe's a, a big guy he could literally lift boulders if he needed to and Daruk um, Sean is you know so interesting so intense and says so many um, um, I'm a jerk wad no he's not no he's not <laughs> And, you know, our, our Princess Zelda, look at her. Regal. She's, she's, she's regal. She has so elegant. Yeah. She's like a little ballerina, you know what I mean? And so, so talented. And everybody else, it's so amazing. I guarantee Except, you, if she had the opportunity, she would practice crying in a swamp to prepare yeah, yeah, for yeah. the role in the game. <laughs> yeah. All of them have similarities except me. I'm 5'8", and Sidon's like 6'5", or something. So. <laughs> you know. Well, as we spoke about last time, you're also... We, we find everybody is like working with you. You're like a positive ray of light, extremely supportive, yeah. detailed, strong, and charismatic. And Let's just ride on his back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Now I have one of my, my personal favorite questions. And um, when I, whenever I get to talk to other voice actors and such, uh, I love this question. This is the best one, I, in my opinion. If you ever meet a voice actor, of course, like today, you should always ask this question. Please share some funny or embarrassing stories from recording in the booth. So, <laughs> people at the Mortal Kombat tournament, do we have anybody from the Mortal Kombat tournament last night here? Woo! So you guys heard this story already, but uh, when I was recording as Rash for Killer Instinct, um, one of his lines is one of his taunts as he does a bit of beatboxing to the pause menu of Battletoads, which is like, oops, 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 oops. it's like that. So, so the guys in the studio, they punch in and go, 
Okay, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and just play a couple bars. Of it. It's just gonna be on repeat, so just listen to it a couple times. And uh, once you get a feel for the beat, just go ahead and ad lib whatever you want to it. Uh, we'll capture some audio and we'll we'll see what we can use in the game. So they start playing the the the. Uh, music over and over and over again. I'm listening to it, getting a feel for it, you know, doing my, my best white boy rap that I can to these. <laughs> but I start getting really into it. You know, I'm, I'm actually beatboxing and like coming up with lyrics and raps. And I had done like a rap during my audition because that was part of the audition. And then I start breaking into like an air guitar solo, like <laughs> So this goes on for like a minute, a minute and a half solid until I'm finally out of breath and I go, <sighs> Okay, was that enough? Do you guys need a, a second take? And they go, uh, actually we only needed about five seconds of that. <laughs> uh, but you were, just, you were just having so much fun, we wanted to see how far you'd go. So, <laughs> good job. <laughs> uh, oh, I love how everybody looks at me. I, yeah. I'm still, I, whenever I, when I have to come up with like favorite moments or funny story, I just, and my mind goes blank. I, I think of like snippets of like all the different like little details of various jobs that I've had. Like you find yourself in the booth and you suddenly are asked to do things like burp several times in a row and you're, yeah. you're just like, oh, you know, like you, you, stuff like that happens all the time. I'm trying to think of like the most f funny story I could think of or the weirdest. <laughs> there are just so many weird moments but you normalize them, you're like, yeah, this is my job. So sometimes you're like, this isn't actually that weird, when in fact it is, it could be weird in a different context. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't really have any good, like, you know, booth stories, but your question did remind me of something. Back when I was in college uh, as a theater student, you know, learning Shakespeare, I did Richard III, uh, Timon of Athens, uh, you know, Hamlet, all that stuff. And so I was learning monologues, soliloquies, ionic <laughs> pentameter, you know, the whole nine yards. And being a young college student, you're hanging out with friends and you're maybe having a couple of drinks, maybe a couple more, a couple so on and so forth. And so my thing in college was I would perform Shakespearean monologues drunk. Like <laughs> drunken, drunken Shakespeare as they called it. And you there were, was just- You were 21 think, though, right? Shakespeare. <laughs> yes. Yes. Shakespeare off the bar. Thank yeah. God nobody <laughs> recorded any of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's just something about having some, you know, being loose and free, and you discover things within the monologue, and you tap into certain emotions and thoughts that maybe you ordinarily wouldn't have had. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I'm mostly on the other side of the booth, so I've seen a lot of entertaining things. Um, so it's, uh, you know, and, and if, you always uh, make sure the actor doesn't feel um, whatever might have happened in the booth. You make sure that they're like, oh, it's okay, that happens, and you know, <laughs> that's no, no problem. I mean, when you're doing stuff, uh, games that have um, a lot of efforts with huah, huah, and deaths and you know, falling off a building, being stabbed, lit on fire, and you know, shot at the same time, there's a lot going on, and they're screaming and screaming, and I've had people um, you know, get sick you know, physically sick in, in booths before. And, uh, you know, I'm always telling them, save 10%. I want, you know, you gotta give it, but save 10%. And some, the actors, God bless y'all, um, they, they don't wanna hold back anything, ever. I'm like, please save 10%. You might have a session in a month or something, you know, or, or if not, tomorrow. Uh, and they just, they go for it and they start, all of a sudden they get sick and then they're, they're, they're apologizing and they're just sweating. and. Uh, and then they could take a break. They, you know, they're embarrassed. And of course, I would never say anything to anybody about what, what happened in these because that's uh, complete non-disclosure always. But there's always some funny thing. And then you, you talk to the actor a little while later, something happened. And uh, um, it's, it's always fun. It's always fun for my side because it's like watching a TV screen. I'm like, oh, I'm glad that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> um, from your position, uh, have you ever had a situation where like, they did something that there wasn't part of it. It was like maybe like a funny moment, like, oh, we're going to put that in the game now. Oh, constantly. It, it all depends on the genre. And I was talking to my, my class yesterday. Depending on the genre, I've directed a lot of Final Fantasy and uh, a lot of um, fantasy-driven games, but also a lot of realistic games, you know, in the real world, grounded like Hitman and, and, and things like that. And when you're working on fantasy games, there's, there's really not that much room for improv because there's a certain um, rhythm to the dialogue, there's a certain um, pacing, and there's, there's, no, there's no casual speak. Um, but when you're doing something like Hitman, where literally there's so much improvising, there's the, the stories are set, but there's a lot of improvising in moments with phone calls and different things like that, where 
literally the client, God bless them, they would say, um, it would, there would be a page and it would just say, Jamie does something amazing with the actor. <laughs> and, you know, because I worked at it for so many years. And so you're constantly finding ridiculous things and um, mistakes. I, I always keep those because it's the way I'm speaking right now. It's grammar's not perfect. You know, you'll, you'll skip a word or you'll yeah. double up a word. And when you have those kind of moments, that's what really grounds a character in, when you're doing games in the real world. So oh, I love that. It's my favorite stuff. And a lot of actors are always try to fix the mistake. And then certain games I work on, I have to train them out of that. So if you make a mistake, just push through it because that's going to sound... More, it's going to sound very on the, realistic and grounded. On the casting side, there was actually a one role I booked where the reason why I booked it was because it was so unfitting to the game and what the <laughs> creators wanted. Yeah. Uh, the audition called for like a Norwegian, Swedish, like electronic dance music person. Um, I, I think it was like for like a war style game, but when I think Norwegian EDM, I think of like, oh, tja, we are going to kick the butts, let's do it, pop it up. So I sent, I sent the audition like, side. oh, the robot is blowing up, let's send them to a high heaven. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, literally that. So, so from what I understand, when I got in the booth, they said, so when we heard that audition, initially we were like, this is completely not what we were going for for this game. But when we presented it to the sound director, who had been listening to these gruff, war-torn, you know, aggressive males for five weeks on end, he listened to that and went, we gotta put this in the game, man. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is so ridiculous, it's, we can't not use it. Yeah. So, you it's know, true. sometimes just going with your gut, even if it's not fitting with what they're specifically asking for, if it's fun and they believe it, it can lead to jobs. Oh, absolutely, when, you can, when you're going against type, yeah. sometimes, you know, de depending on what's going on, I mean, there's, uh, one of the things I like to do with different types of games is cast against type. Um, there was, uh, Halo 4 and 5, they wanted a, a, a Chris Evans type. And I brought in a guy that was maybe about five foot six, overweight, and they were like, we're, we're, we're gonna uh, facial capture him, we, and we're gonna motion capture his movement. We really want this sort of Captain America style big guy. Yeah. And I said, you know, you gotta listen to this guy, you gotta watch him. And uh, mm. it was completely against type. And they, they, they loved him. They fell in love with him in Halo 4 and Halo 5, uh, Darren O'Hare. Wow. You know, he was, uh, you know, he's just a great actor. And uh, mm -hmm. he, um, he, he blew them away. So very much so with that kind of thing. But certain games like Final Fantasy, different things like that, there's mm -hmm. sort of archetypes. You yeah. Know, yeah. Uh, I've had to do some singing before in character, which I am not a trained singer by any stretch of the imagination. And so that's always been a lot of fun and a lot of challenging because, you know, they'll, they're like, oh, well, just go ahead and sing it. Just give it a try. And I was like, you know I'm not a singer. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I kind of come with the approach of, because you know, there have been times where they've, they've said, well, we can get a, a, an actual trained singer to, you know, do your character song and all that stuff. And I said, well, I'll give you what, you, you know, give you the song. If you like it, you can keep it. If you don't like it, bring in an actual, honest to goodness, <laughs> classically trained singer. My feelings will not be hurt. Um, and then there have been times where they've said, no, Joe, it's okay. Your character is a bad singer. <laughs> it's okay. No, we want him to sound <laughs> terrible. And Imagine so, if they followed up with, that's why we cast you. <laughs> you know, so you just got to roll with the punches. Patricia's a, a trained, oh, know, yeah. classically trained singer. I would not say classically well, trained. My just, sister is. So, yeah. 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 You should yeah. sing but, for his character. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> She's got a sex album. Guy. Yeah, that brings music to my ears. <laughs> One of the favorite things uh, from the last con that we did in Salt Lake was I, I think we had each other read each other's like catchphrases. Oh, yeah. So beautiful. like you were doing, you know, like, great job, little guy. <laughs> yeah. And like just hearing you do it. And I was trying to do, you know, Urbosa's yeah. Fury, and I'm not even, I'm not even going to do it because, like, Elizabeth was like, what is that? <laughs> so, but <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Elizabeth has some great stories about casting and stuff like, too, like, the things yeah. that she's tried during, during casting. She's a fine singer. You have a second album coming out, don't you? Oh, yes. Oh, oh you want me to pitch myself? Yes, yes I, I'm, my band is recording a second album. We're almost finished. We'll, we'll be releasing in the fall, so... Uh, no, you got to say, it, it drops band. in the fall. It That's drops. what the kids are saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Drop yeah. It, yeah, yeah. drops in the fall. But where can they find it? Like when you run out of stamina while climbing a cliff. <laughs> yeah, speaking of, follow, follow our social medias. You can find what we're doing on there. Um, J.D. Mortolaro over here. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Who has a Mr. Twitter, by the way. Which is also J.D. Mortolaro, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You should follow him. I'm yeah. a big boy now. If you want to know Twitter anything about voice Instagram. acting, follow this guy. I'm a Twitter.com. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. 
I promise we'll get to your questions. I see all y'all yeah. over there being very patient. Yeah. I love you. <laughs> oh, I was like looking. I'm like, I can only see the podium. What? <laughs> I see you guys. Okay. With that being said, let's go ahead and uh, <coughs> jump into the Q&A. Let's do it. All right. Come on up. Say your name. I'm Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go fast. Hello. How you doing? Hey. <laughs> Hello yeah. again. Good to see you. So my question is, what? Technical issues. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Go. Okay. <laughs> so my question is, do you have a favorite part when you watch the trailer of The Legend of Zelda? A favorite part of the trailer? The, you know, just watching the trailer. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And, and watching and, and listening to Patricia's performance and her dialogue oh, yeah. and her delivery yeah. just oh, really nice. adds so much heart and soul to the trailer. Just, I mean, it's like, it's just, gosh, it's and so the shock, good. Yeah. The shock of people hearing, yeah. is that Zelda? Yeah. Oh, oh my God, is that Zelda? <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a special kind of magic, because stuff happens all the time in production. Like there, are, I'm sure each of us has a case where we have recorded a full session for a character and not hurt ourselves in the final product, because mm -hmm. things change, yeah. they decide they want to go in a different direction, the game gets canceled, anything can happen. Yeah. So for us, Often, the moment when it really hits home is when the trailer is out or the game is out and someone's posted a video online and we hear the character saying the line and recognize that it's still our voice. Yeah. And we're like, this is official, it's yeah. real, it's there for good. I didn't get Following that up with, uh, yeah. with my favorite part is the, is the last moment where it shows release date. Yeah. You know, then I'm like, now it's official. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> this is not... This is not a dig on, on any of the industry or any voice actors, but as someone who has made their entire career out of speaking and hearing others speak and listening to dialogue, I actually have a special place in my heart for emotional scenes that don't have dialogue. Like being able to tell a great story or, or uh, get across a certain emotion without having characters explain it to you um, is very enthralling to me. So that part in the trailer where the music starts swelling up, where it's like da 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 da, and it's just like swaths of landscape and just showing Link running across the horizon, just showing how far the draw distance is in the game, these mountains in the distance. No one's speaking, it's just showing the grandiose nature of, of what these... Here it comes! <laughs> seeing, seeing these larger-than-life characters dropping down onto the ground, just all this flurry of action without any words tied to it, that is what really like hit it home for me. It's like, I don't... I, I'm so excited to hear everyone perform, but I don't have to wait for the cutscenes to just experience this feeling of adventure. And that's a sign of a really good game, is when you can enjoy the quiet moments, or the loud music quiet moments, as much as you can enjoy the, the moments of interaction between characters. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. I was actually, when you, when you asked that question, I was thinking, my favorite part of the trailer is definitely the music. And in yeah. fact, a couple of weeks ago I ended up, I watch a lot of video game symphonies and uh, I, I, I love them and I've watched a couple of you know Zelda related live music orchest orchestral events and I went to one a couple of weeks ago and they actually featured Breath of the Wild in it and so I sat quietly, nobody knew who I was, it was just sort of up there uh, amidst a lot of uh, gamers and everybody was like freaking out about it but they played the trailer music and I'd never heard it done live by a live orchestra before and it really affected me because I was like wow wow, it's been two years and that music is like coming at me, but it's like right from the trailer, but it's live. And it was, it was really a, quite a fantastic moment. Yeah, yeah. very nice. Thank, well, thank you for the quest. Thank you. Yeah, no thank problem. Thank you for the quest. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Have a good thank one. You. Thank you. <laughs> now I want to do like a Beat Saber song to like one of the Breath <laughs> of the Wild tracks. Hi there. Hey, how you doing? Hi. Um, you can adjust the mic. Uh, um, so my question is, what was the journey like from when you first started your career to where you are now? Wow. That's, a, That's a good question. I'm waiting on you guys. I'm not going to yeah. go first again. Yeah. If, if you take the game of Breath of the Wild and you make that into life, that's, that's what yeah. it's like. <laughs> I'm still leveling right now. That, so, yeah. Actually, that's, that's right. When I first wanted to get into voiceover, I, I walked down uh, the streets of Saginaw until I came across a homeless guy in front of a fire. Um, I gave him an apple, and he gave me tips on how to get into the industry. <laughs> 
you know, I, 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 set, I, set, I set fire to a bunch of trees, got arrested, and uh, when I was in front of court, I managed to put on a different voice, and they're like, we got the wrong guy. He's not, he's not the one we arrested. Um, so that kind of introduced me to the world of acting. And <laughs> I love you, Sean. I just love your answer so much. <laughs> I have a kid at home, so I'm living life on hard mode. <laughs> so that's, yeah, just how I look at it. Uh, no, man, I mean... Um, I mean, I can only speak to my experience, but like, I've been in voiceover taking classes that kind of started maybe around 2012, around that time. And so, you know, the thing about voiceover is nobody gives you like a map. There's no, there's nothing that's like, okay, this is where you go. Uh, and you just kind of have to figure it out and feel it out for yourself. And there are times where you take wrong turns or you have setbacks or speed bumps or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, there are times where, you know, you work on really boring, mundane type of stuff, and every once in a while, you get to work on something like this, and it is just the coolest frickin' thing in the whole world, man. Yeah. yeah. For I, me, oh, go ahead, go ahead, no. you go. No. Uh, for me, it was like, I, I, gaming was the last thing on my mind that I'd be getting into, but uh, I was a live action director directing commercials and stuff, and I, <clears throat> I've talked about it often. I directed the first N64 commercial, the first Bomberman commercial, the first Game Boy Pocket TV commercial. So I got in the industry sort of that way and uh, d directed lots of commercials. Then my rep told me about, um, really about the storytelling with gaming. And my first game, uh, big game that I directed was EverQuest mm -hmm. 2. And that was uh, 100 years ago. But it was, uh, it was a big game. It was like 110,000 lines of dialogue. It was a massive game. And... Uh, so I just found that I wanted to try this. I thought, well, this would be interesting. And we talked about motion capture, and um, I actually directed the first TV commercial that used motion capture. Wow, that's Captain crazy. Captain Crunch. Wow. And um, so uh, it was pretty you fun. You met the real Captain Crunch? I did. I did. He drank, drinks a lot. <laughs> um, but, milk, uh, so I milk. Started <laughs> yeah, milk, right. So, he, uh, uh, so I started that way. Then uh, this game came up, and I said, you know, this is something... It was groundbreaking, the visuals. Um, compared to now, it's not as much, but at the time, that was open world. It was massive multiplayer. It was so amazing. I was like, I really like this. This is really great. You know, feature film script might have 120 pages max, and the games that i fortunate to work on sometimes have thousands of pages. So the storylines, for me, I love telling stories and working with actors and, and finding the moments and putting that puzzle together. So then all of a sudden, boom, started working on games and, uh, and haven't looked back. Um, in giving a serious answer to, as an actor, that path from starting out to getting to Breath of the Wild, uh, without making it into like a 30-minute panel answer, um, I, I really think it can all be boiled down to a, just a mixture of, of opportunities and preparation. Because there's that old phrase, you know, preparation plus opportunity equals success. Um, and when I think about my early career and moving out to California and, and getting, into, getting in with new studios and new clients, it was always this mixture of either um, having an opportunity to apply what I know so far to try and land a new gig or, or get in with a new client, or spending my free time with additional preparation so that when the next opportunity comes in, I'm able to do the best I can. And that, that applies across my entire career. Back in college when I was starting out, it was mostly just preparation because there wasn't much of an industry out there. So I was preparing, 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 being part of student theater groups, you know, doing freelance work on the side, doing silly comic dubs for fun. And then an opportunity came along, which was AX Idol in 2009 with Bang Zoom. And I was prepared, so I managed to win it. And they said, hey, when can you come in and do a general audition? Uh, in three years when I graduate college. So the remaining three years, prep, 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 came out, did the general audition. They said, okay, you're good enough. We'll start bringing in for sessions. Worked up my reputation with them over time. And just all of my professional career has been taking workshops, continuing to do my freelance work, practicing on the side. And then every time one of these new opportunities comes up, you know, uh, uh, Studio A saying, hey, this other sister studio uh, run by this guy, Jamie Mortellaro, is looking for auditions for, you know, this game. If you're interested, send an email. And I get the auditions, and I go, okay, well, I recognize this character archetype from what I've played in the past. I recognize this character archetype. This one is a little out of my wheelhouse, but you know what? I think I can put something together based on what I know. So it's, it really just boils down to when an opportunity comes along, I do the best I can, and if I don't feel like I was prepared enough, I know what to focus on once I'm done. And following up on that, like the workshop, I see some, see you back there, Montana, and I see like uh, uh, it, what Sean's saying is, if you're interested in, in pursuing a, a career in voiceover, it is nothing but practice, practice, practice. It's a very hard industry, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. 
pursue when you pursue it you got have to work on it all the time exactly yeah. the way Sean's talking about it it can't be something that well I think I, I want to do that and then you know months go by and you screw around with your friends or something like that and you do a little uh, dubbing you know uh, there, there's no casual voiceover no, you no, have to be it's all, be all in, in 100 percent on average we spend about 50 times more time uh, not booking gigs yeah. but still trying out than we spend yeah. in the studio on jobs we've worked. Just, just to build on that because you know like yes you you do several auditions each and every day and sometimes you you just have to be okay with knowing I'm probably not gonna get this you know this looks like a really cool project you have to be, you, like you have to like switch something off in your brain or like have a couple of screws in your head loose because it's very thick skin this yeah. is gonna be, really this gonna be a it's, really it's, fun it's role for Matt Mercer yeah <laughs> And so, but you have to go in and you have to give it your all. And, you know, uh, you know, sometimes, yeah, they will pick Matt Mercer. But sometimes they're like, you know what, we want to try something different. Or, you know what, we really like what they brought to the table. Because ultimately you have to, you have to tap into what makes you unique. And, and nobody can be you but you. That's why it's called unique. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, a funny story. I just wanted to follow As up with you what you were saying, Sean, about uh, sometimes people can surprise you, and it was like not, it was uh, eye-opening for all of us. You never judge a book by the cover. You never know what somebody could bring. And when uh, Sean came in and auditioned for Rivali, we were like, oh, oh my God, that's great. That's amazing. And they were like, well, you know, Teba, you know, so let's, just, let's try that. And then he said he wanted to audition for the Deco Tree. And we're just like, well, we've got these big guys coming in. That's okay. You know, you know, he's not a big guy, and he's, you know, we've got, we've got, uh, the deep voice guys coming in, so thank you. He's like, please let me audition for that. So we're just like, okay, go ahead. And all of a sudden he stands at the mic and he does this. Oh, and all of a sudden his voice comes out. We're like, oh my God, it was unbelievable. So he surprised us. And so we, you know, that old adage, never judge a book by the cover. And we should have known that by now. But uh, it was a fast paced audition. We were getting some stuff done. So he crushed that one too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Uh, this question is for Sean. Uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, who did you enjoy voicing more, Vali or Teba? Who did I? Okay. <sighs> All right. This is not a cop out, so hear me out. It's it's the question is who did I enjoy voicing more? Yep. Okay. So I enjoyed both of them for completely separate reasons. Um, Rivali was an inc he was an oh he was so difficult for me because I came in with a very solid idea of how I thought I would be playing the character and we went in a different direction basically because it was a difference in how his confidence was being displayed so I was starting back from ground zero but I loved this character so damn much that I refused to give up on him um, I mentioned the previous panel you know like I, I had a breakdown in the middle of the first session because I was so scared about not being able to give him the performance that I wanted him to have but I'm so glad it happened with a character like Rivali because despite how frustrated I was, I knew I wasn't going to give up and I'm glad it happened with him. So that's why he's important to me. Teba is important to me on a performance aspect because if Rivali was a case where I thought I knew where we were gonna go with him and we didn't, Teba was a case where when they, when they gave me the sample scene before I was gonna do reads for him, the minute I saw his character I said, I know what he sounds like in my head. Because I had this reference, if any, anyone's familiar with this old animated series called The Bedfellows, I voiced this very angry character named Sheen. And I said, what if I take the anger of Sheen and I just make it into bitterness instead? So I said, let me try that. And, they, and I said, I know what he sounds like. And they said, go ahead, give it to us. And so I started talking as Teva, you know, as this very calm but distrusting bird. And exactly what I had in my head, they said, perfect, let's roll with it. So Teva is a case where the voice that I presented to them unchanged is what went into the final game. And as an actor, having your creation become the official canon is like... Oh, it's the best feeling in the world. So, Rivali is personal to me because of my attachment to him. Teba is personal to me because it was a culmination of my opportunity plus my preparation equaling a personal success. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Good morning. I love morning. your hat. Oh, thank you. I bought a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the question I have is, is there any role that you wish that you could, uh, that you could redo? <laughs> Ooh, redo. Oh, redo. Oh, probably half Ooh. of them, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I, so there, there isn't 
I'll, I'll think of if there was a role I wish it could redo. Generally, I, I try to come in with 110% and, and just be grateful. Because I don't expect any role of mine to be perfect. Like, I always assume there will be lines that I wish I could be, go back and re-record, but I just try to do my best to be prepared. There is a role that I was forced to redo that I wish I didn't have to, and that was Hummel from East Lacrimosa of Donna. Because the first time that I recorded for Hummel, I actually was sick. I had come back from, uh, from my stepbrother's wedding and I had grunge in my throat, but they didn't want to reschedule. They said, just come in and record anyway, we'll see what happens. But it worked out in my favor because since I was sick, I had like this, this natural gravel, like Steve Bloom rasp to my throat, but I didn't have to force it into my throat, which usually makes me go deeper. So I was able to talk like this, you know, younger teen, like this 16, 17 year old, um, but still have this cool, you know, edgy hot topic rasp to my voice. <laughs> And, and normally you're not supposed to record if you're sick. Like you're not supposed to audition if you're sick and I hadn't, but in this case, it made him sound super edgy and it was perfect. But they ended up relocalizing the text and so that forced them to re-record about 85% of my content. So they brought me back in and I was nice and healthy this time and I feel like I was able to get close to matching it, but it definitely wasn't the same as when it was just a natural rasp in my throat. So I'm actually mad that I was healthy for when I did the re-record. And if I'd known, I would have like, screamed for two hours to ruin my throat beforehand so I could have come in and be like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> so I, I loved what I did the first time around and I'm so sad that they weren't able to use it. You know, it's a good question though, because I, you know, I work with hundreds of actors and I think like any artist, once they do something, no, nobody's ever 100% satisfied. Yeah. So there's always, even if there's a, a great performance, there's always something that um, they look back and whether you're a filmmaker or a voice talent or an on-camera actor, there's always something that oh, God, I wish I could have done that, or I would have yeah. done this, or tried that, and I, I can't speak for the, the two of you, but, I, but I, I know a bunch of actors that, that feel that way. Well, well, let me tell you this. The ones where I have to sing, those are the ones I wish I could go back and redo. Uh, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, but but kind of to your point, Jamie, I'll go back and I'll listen to MP3s or auditions or things that I've done in workshops from five, six, seven, eight years ago, and it's like, <laughs> oh, man, what was I, I, what was I thinking? You know, like, oh gosh, I was so dumb. I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I was just, you know, I was just kind of eh. And, and so the idea is that you're supposed to be better today than you were yesterday. Um, and it's so, practice and that's yeah. good. It's a yeah. sign of growth. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's what the, again, the adage of people trying to get into voice acting. Yeah. Practice, practice, practice. I have a really boring answer for that because it's not really, um, it's not voice acting related, it's actually theater related, but there's one role in my life that was ex extraordinary, it was like one of the, the coolest roles that I'd ever gotten to do on stage up until that point, and I've always wanted to go back and redo it, and that's Hedda Gabler, if anybody oh. knows uh, and, uh, theater at all, and yeah, I'm yes. a big Ibsen fan. And I got to play yeah. that role at a really pivotal time, and I learned a lot from it, but I felt at the end of the play that I had just learned it at the very end of the play, what, what it was actually about. Because they cast me, as has often happened for me, cast me older on stage than what I am, partly because my natural voice is so bloody deep. And I, I, when I was 22, people were like, oh, you're 30, you know? And I was like, so the gravitas of her character needed to be much older, but I didn't have the life experience going in to really understand what she was totally going through. And now I'm like, oh my God, I, just, I could nail that so well if I could get back on stage and do that again. So it might happen. Awesome. Wasn't Patrick Stewart in the film version of that? Ooh, he might have been in one. There were several versions of that. I'm, I'm trying to think. There were many versions of it. Uh, Kate Blanchett did it on Broadway Ooh. a few years ago. Uh, it comes up all the time. It's yeah. like a really classic... Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't see that version on I film. I remember seeing a, a with film Patrick, version. With Patrick like, Stewart? Yeah, Picard, rock on, man. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Hey! Hello. Hey! hey I met every one of you like, with the autograph and film, the voice acting thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. You were great. By, Thank yeah. you for coming to that. Yeah. Thank you. I love all your work. And my question is for all of you, except for Jamie, but you'll like this question <laughs> because it involves you, and that is for Cho, Shane, and Pat Patricia. What was your experience with casting and voice director Jamie for Legends of the Breath of the Wild? So, so, just so I understand, what was our experience with working with him? Yes, all Awful. three of you. Oh, never horrible. Ever, never. Ever again. Just <laughs> disastrous. This guy wanted me to pretend to be a talking bird? Like, yeah. <laughs> he wanted me to sing. Oh. 
He he called me. He said you're an amazing. He said when I think of jerkwad. Sean Chiplock. You come to mind. You are you are perfect for that. So no, I said it at the previous panel, but uh, it, Jamie was so hesitant to take on the role of Sidon because he wanted to give another actor a chance first. But the fact is, and I make no exaggeration, this guy is Sidon. He just he opens his mouth and nothing but praise comes out. I. I've had a chance to work with a lot of directors and a lot of clients, and I say this with, with no exaggeration. He is one of my favorite people yeah. that I've ever... His oh. level of support, his level of looking out for both veteran talent and brand new talent who he knows has potential is, is unmatched by anyone else I've seen in the industry or in Los Angeles so far. He, and his, his support is just unending. Like, you're, we're talking about me having a breakdown in the middle of my session. I come yeah. back, and this guy... No hesitation. It's like, all right, buddy, let's do this. You know, like he is in your corner a hundred percent of the time. I love that you just did like a, a random, like slight Jamie impression right there, and I was cool. like, oh, That's I can cool. hear that. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the number of times he's had to tell me to shut up so that he can talk to the client in between takes, but he never gets mad at me. He's just like, it's cool, it's cool. Just wait a minute, just wait a minute, buddy. I'll, I'll get back oh, to you. Oh wow! So he's amazing. He's great. Yeah, I, I love him. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You guys can answer too. Will you let us? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Just go ahead. Hi there. Hi. Oh, hi. you can bring that. Bring that down. Yeah. Just, just go. Err. There we are. All right. Um, hi. My hi name again. is Hal. I saw hey. You hi, Hal. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if it was really intimidating to do the first fully voiced Legend of Zelda game ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it was. You want to? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we kind of talked about it a little bit on Friday, but you know. Jamie, like, dude, you look at his resume, it speaks for itself, man. The guy, I, and you're, you're totally, you know, hump, this, this, he really is one of the best freaking directors in the business, man. Thanks, man. It doesn't get said enough. Yep. Thank you, thank you. That is not, there's no BS in that statement yeah. because obviously it's to our advantage to say that because he's right here and we all want to work <laughs> with him again. But in all seriousness, yeah. yeah. Joe and so and when, yeah. when you take that and then you take the fact that, yes, this is, the Legend of Zelda. This is, you know, this is such a legendary property, you know, no pun intended. And you come in and you're working on something like this, and then to have Nintendo people fly out from Washington to come watch your sessions, it's like, dude, the pressure is on. <laughs> that being said, though, Jamie, like, just could not have been more supportive. He is your biggest fan when you're when you're working. Everybody wants you to succeed. Um, and so I would say the most pressure that was being put on myself was, was from me. I was psychic, because I'm a fan of the series. I grew up playing these games. I know the, the level of expectations that come with the new Zelda game. So, you know, you gotta bring it, man, and, and you just gotta knock it out of the park each and every time. And, and so, you know, you just kind of get in your head and you just, you want it to be absolutely perfect each and every time. You know, like, hey, Joe, no pressure, but this game releases on the same day as the Switch, so uh, your performance may affect whether or not our console sells well enough, but uh, have fun in the studio. Let me, let me ask you, do I have to sing? Okay, then. We were banking very heavily on your singing selling this console. Um, do you want to go? I'll do, yeah, I'll, I'll okay. do. I would say, yes, of course, when you get a big game and you actually, because of course, when we auditioned, we didn't know what it was. Yeah. Um, and then when you do discover what it is, you feel, <laughs> yeah, the, the excitement level and you, you, you project into the future, you, you know, you, you try to, to bring everything you can to the role. And then ultimately, it has to be a marriage of what you have in the moment, what you are going to bring to it, and that, just like getting down to work. Um, the, the excitement is, is just inborn in something like this where when you're doing it, it is like it's kind of got a sacredness to it and it's, it's magical and you, you just really hope it goes well. But at the same time, you're a professional and you, and you get down to work and yeah. you make it about making the best character based on the script that you have in front of you and how do you breathe life into that real human or, you know, anthropomorphized bird or whatever, you know. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, so, yeah. full disclosure, I would still absolutely pay $60 for a game where I hear, I can't wait to bomb some Lionels, but <laughs> I, I, 
any initial excitement was immediately replaced with intense fear because <laughs> we knew, I, I at least knew that yes, there was uh, games in the past that had voiceover that is well loved by the community, um, but that also meant it was going to be scrutinized very heavily, and even just in comparison to other games of the genre, um, not necessarily that franchise. So uh, it was intimidating. Like Joe said, almost all the pressure was inflicted upon myself by myself. Um, but it was just as much out of love as it was out of fear. It was just as much because we are such big fans of the franchise, because we were so in love with the ability to work on this game that we respected so much, we expected a lot out of ourselves. And so it, it was just a matter of, of keeping that under wraps enough and reminding ourselves that we're here because we're passionate. And because we're passionate, we have the potential to give this game what it deserves. And, and taking it with that mindset of, yes, we can, kind of helped uh, uh, dismiss some of those fears. And, and watching the actors go through... Um, the five the, stages of grief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the auditions uh, process and, and knowing that if any one of these actors that are, that are auditioning for me um, knew what this was, they would, they, some of them might break down, some of them might, it might put too much pressure on themselves. So it's part, keeping it that's, uh, secret from them is, it's two part, keeping it so that nothing is revealed to the community and also there's, keeping the pressure off the actors a little bit, especially for something like this. Um, and when I was able to finally tell each actor, it was a really great moment, you know, being able to tell each actor what, what this was and everyone, everybody reacted very differently. One, I won't say who, squealed and ran to the bathroom. Uh, I don't a, know who you're talking about. It's a mystery. <laughs> it was adorable. And so, you know, we just knew that he was, he was a right guy. And everybody just, you know, after they initially find out what it is and, and understand the, the scope of it, that then kind of dissipates a little bit. And for myself included, because now you're down, getting down to the work. And it's the same as any other session. And I approach, no matter what game I'm directing, I approach it with the same intensity, same... Um, professionalism and you know uh, interest in getting the best performance I can and uh, so once they were in the booth there's n there was never that you know this is Zelda this is Zelda this is Zelda you know it's not that constant thing so now it's just them and me and working with my clients and 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 getting to the moment and then maybe after then they're thinking those second guessing things one of the other uh, um, somebody else asked about you know, do you wish you did something different? And I, I'm, I'm sure at some points, maybe even forgot, but when you get out of the booth, you're like, oh, God, that, that one moment took a three or four takes, maybe five or six takes. God, could I have done that word this way, that, you know, there's, there's all those little moments. And you could see that in their faces. You could see that they just want to do so, uh, do so well. But a lot of the pressure is, is gone once you're in the middle of it. But at the beginning of the session, at the end of the session, there's still, you know, some intensity. There are times where I walked out, like, you kind of have, like, a little bit of amnesia. Yeah. Where you're like, okay, you're, I'm, I'm done recording, and it's like, what did I just do? What happened? Yeah. Where, where, where were we? Like, you know, you were there, you were there, and you were there, you know. So mm -hmm. it's just, you know, you're just so focused, you're so in the zone of, like, what you're trying to do, and then you exit the booth, and now it's like, oh, okay, I can relax. I can, I can just chill out and just, like, be myself again. Um, but I, I say that in the best absolute way possible. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of figured you'd yeah. just walk out of the booth like, God, glad that's over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's sometimes, Definitely I imagine, not, yeah. it's like, Ugh. you know, they're yeah. happy they did it, but there's, you know, in, in all games, there's, there's a, a business aspect to everything. You, do, you don't have unlimited time. Yeah. Right. You have a certain amount of time. Of course, you know, if you have to go over, nobody wants to do that. There's budgets, and you want to get as much as you can in the time that you that was budgeted. But and then sometimes you got to go over. Sometimes they rewrite a, uh, a scene, and then you go back. You know, another day. <laughs> but there is there's time restriction on this stuff too. So it's not just going in there and just getting what you need to get. There's there's time restriction. So that's a little pressure too. Oh, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm make it to everybody this time. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, do you guys have any funny stories of getting into a character for a role and then forgetting to get out of character in public? Ooh. Ooh. I'm gonna leave this to those Dangerous guys. question. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so some of you guys already know this, but I, I do character voices in the park over at uh, Disneyland. I do the voice of <laughs> Crush the Sea Turtle over at Turtle Talk with Crush. Go, dude, go! Um, and I, thank you. I've been doing it for about 
15 years now, ever since Righteous. the show. Righteous. Righteous. <laughs> uh, there was one day I was driving around with a couple buddies of mine, and this was like very early on in the show. I'd been like, again, you know, you just say dude like several thousand times in your just natural day. So it, it bleeds over, you know, into, you know, you know later on. And uh, I was driving around, and this car almost backed into me. And so I just—I had to like just swerve to not get hit. And I was like, "Whoa, dude!" You know. And it's like it was just—it's just gut gut reaction to just not, you know, get t-boned by a car in the parking lot. Yeah. So there's that. Um, there was a commercial audition, or it was a promo I was doing for Pretty Little Liars, and they had me do this kind of stereotypical, like, "Oh my God, look at their hair! It's fantastic." <laughs> Um, and then I was starting to drive to my, my night shift job, and I could not escape from this voice. And I was like, <laughs> I am going to be so scared if I'm working at like 1.30 in the morning going, hello, your alarm went off. Is someone trying to sneaky weaky in through the back door? Do we need to send the cops? I'll take care of that for you right now. Um, so uh, I had to call my wife, and she was like, "Quick, like, what's the what's the whitest thing you can say?" And I was like, "Oh, this party is off the chain." Oh, thank you so much. This is great. <laughs> oh, oh my god. So, yeah, that was that was a near miss, especially because there there was someone like that who worked at where I worked, and I was so scared that I was gonna like royally tick them off and like get reported to HR. So. <laughs> I'm really glad I do break out of character so that I don't walk around because I usually play female assassins or female like <laughs> warriors, and you know that's a little dangerous if you think about it. But yeah, stab someone. Oops, yeah, sorry, I yeah, just lurking around like stalking everybody. No, I, I don't. Um, but I, in general, I think whenever I'm prepping a character, you wouldn't be able to tell if I'm running lines in my head or if I'm sort of getting ready for an audition or getting ready to to go to film. What will happen is that I'll be walking around my house doing things and completely forget everything that I've just done. Like, where are my keys? Did I leave the coffee on the thing? Like, I, I'll completely go into another place. You actually have to be really careful sometimes when you're imagining too hard and you're trying to multitask, if that makes any sense. <laughs> it's better to keep it in the space when you can, you know. I think the closest for me is that uh, maybe, you know, because I'm, I'm a director and uh, I think I was at Costco one time and I saw the guy bring his microphone down and he started speaking into it and I said, oh, wait, Slow it down and make sure it's <laughs> you know. So that's about it for me. Oh, that's funny. Thank you. Thanks. So I was going to point out we have uh, we have three minutes left, so let's get through this one too. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> it's okay. Hi. Um, my name is Bethany. Hi. Hi, Bethany. Hi, Bethany. Hi. Can you move in just a little bit? Yeah. Thank like, you. There we go. There you go. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a generic question, but I still want to ask it. Do you have any favor a favorite moment in your whole career of uh, voice acting in general? Hmm. There's probably so many favorites that yeah. they could, can't even. I mean, all of them are so prolific and they do so many things, but maybe a highlight. You know yeah, I mean? I'll choose one. Uh, there was a, a sort of weird life moment that I had some years ago, which actually changed the direction of my career. I'd almost quit acting at one point to do artist education and move up to the Arctic, funny enough. There was a point in my life where I wanted to do that. And instead I ended up, weirdly, on the set of Smurfs, doing the, the puppeteering for Smurfette and Vexy and, and the sort of on-set voice and all the kind of like, uh, you know, behind the scenes live action stuff for Hank Azaria and Brendan Gleeson and everything. And so we were in, like, it was like night, they'd water down the streets and it was like a glistening street and Gargamel, who was Hank Azaria, had to do this action over and over again. It's like 3 a.m. at this point because it's a night shoot. I'm kind of out of my mind, these really long set days. And I kept on having to shout <laughs> over and over again, I am a Smurf, like over and over again. <laughs> and I was like, this is my life right now and it's amazing. Like, yeah, so that, that would be one of That's my favorite awesome. moments. Yeah. I actually can't talk about mine yet, but it involves this guy, and uh, I'm sorry for the cop, but like, every, I'm sure every actor has their full, cir at least one full circle moment, whether it's a role or a project or just something that they've learned that really kind of encapsulates why they got into the industry and why they love it so much. Um, and I've, I've had milestones throughout my career that I'm really proud of, you know, first major role, first time I'm televised on Toonami, you know, first time playing a game that a lot of the gaming world knows about, in this case, Breath of the Wild. Um, but recently, I had the chance to be a part of a project that 
uh, became that full circle moment for me. Like I, I can't really say there's any other uh, event besides this one that when it comes out and I'm able to experience it for myself, I'm gonna end up crying because it's gonna be unbelievable that That's I'm gonna be, that I'm gonna be a part of it. So what I will answer for this is please follow me on at Sonic Mega on Twitter because <laughs> if you want to see me break, plug. if you want to see me break down like an eight year old who was just given a peanut butter sandwich with the crust still on. Um, <laughs> The best place to find, watch that happen in real time will be on my Twitter account. Okay. So it's an amazing game. Wait till you see. Please be I'm very excited. Please be patient yeah. with me. I promise it will be worth it. Um, real quick, I trained very briefly with uh, Bill Farmer, who is the voice of Goofy. And uh, day one of training, we, we went in, and uh, he trains out of his house. And uh, he was just like, you know, hey, Joe, why don't you come over? And he shows me his computer, and he has these, uh, these new... Um, like uh, Mickey Mouse cartoons that they're working on for like their YouTube channel and all that stuff. And there was just this moment where we're like, we're just sitting down watching cartoons. And I'm like, I'm here with <laughs> Bill Farmer, the, like Goofy himself. And we're watching a Goofy cartoon. Yeah. And it's like, what is going on here? Like, this is, it's, it's just, awesome. it's just very, very surreal. And for Bill, it was just, you know, just every day, like, hey, check out this thing I'm doing right now. And it's like, I'm, I'm standing next to the man. Like, what is, what's going on here? So it was just a moment of just like, just unbelievable. So yeah. what we're trying to say is Breath of the Wild origin animated series win? <laughs> true, though, true, though. For me, it's more of a, you know, more of the directing part of it. And it's uh, some of the people, some projects I've worked on and some of the people I've been able to work with. And I've directed Mark Hamill a bunch of times, and having worked with Mark Hamill, you That's know, amazing. just and then him just sitting down after and just chatting and just telling you behind the scenes Star Wars oh. stories, and you're just like, oh, That's, uh, yeah, that's uh, awesome. Uh, you know, and then <laughs> Billy Dee Williams in the same game, it was Let It Die, that directed it a couple of years ago, and uh, just having people like that you work with, and then I worked with Oprah Winfrey uh, for, you know, as an intern, and so many, many. Many times there's people in projects that I work on and I could go on and on of just like these astonishing moments that I'm like, all right, I'm doing this. Yeah. I'm with this person, you know, so it's been a lot of yep. really wonderful moments. Yeah. Right, well, thank you so much for taking the time to answer my question. Oh, thank, you. Thank, thank you. you Bethany. And thank you all Give for coming. Give them a round of applause, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.